on investment planning, the main thing is to have a look at the overall sort of uh, roadmap for an investor. We sit down with them and we discuss, of course, their needs, and we discuss then a strategy to meet uh, the requirements, their needs, risk and return, and various other constraints they may have. And of course, we know uh, cash, uh, shares, bonds, alternatives, what might be in the investment mix to meet their requirements. So the uh, first thing we want is just a starting point as an advisor for your client. Of course, we, we assess a certain amount of things, don't we, guys? We sit down with them, do a fact find, get to know our client, and we say, right, I mean, are we looking more for capital growth over the longer term, uh, say five to ten years, for example? Are we looking for steady income flow? Do you need to, of course, spend income out of the portfolio? So that's going to have implications, isn't it, whether you take bonds versus shares or indeed property or something like that. And, of course, tax, you know, there's also an implication for that. So the starting point. It's really like the roadmap, guys, for the portfolio. Give ourselves an idea where we're going. And uh, investment horizon, of course, guys, it's going to be a case of short, medium, long term. The shorter the horizon, the more focus there will be on liquidity. Of course, the longer the horizon, the more focus there will be on things like inflation and risk. So things like that, folks, you know, short-term focusing on liquidity, longer-term focusing on inflation risk. Clearly, other risks can be relevant, but just as an example there. And finally, guys, risk appetites. Uh, typically, uh, you'll have to assess this, of course, with your own questionnaires, and everyone has their own version of it. But uh, I'm asking questions like, you know, um, do you believe investing is all a matter of luck? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you prefer to have all your money in the bank where you know it's safe? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to regard you as obviously a very cautious investor. Um, clearly, you don't like losing capital and you don't want to take on any risk. That's a personality trait, and we have to work with that, don't we? Even if the, uh, in the investor is wealthy, has no dependence, has the ability to take risk, we can't force them, of course, to take risk. And so we have to assess that. Of course, the other way would be someone who's very you know, gung-ho, aggressive, risk-seeking. But if they are people with family, dependents, grandparents, and we can't exactly advise them to take that, uh, that, that, that path. So we need to assess their personality, folks. Um, again, questionnaires should be used uh, to assess that. And personality means their willingness, their willingness, guys, to take risk. Now, um, the chapter, guys, fairly um, traditional in this area. We're going to talk about the uh, ways in which advisors discuss risk and return uh, measures. And uh, we'll look at ratios coming up today called like the Sharpe ratio, which is very typically used for funds. It assesses how much return a fund has achieved to, based on the risk it's taken. And so we call this a sort of uh, mean variance optimization. That's the fancy way of talking about risk, return, or mean, which is return, variance, risk. We want to minimize, guys, the risk we take. We want to maximize the return we make. So, modern portfolio theory. Um, if you read the background on this, guys, it comes from somebody called Harry Markowitz, and he's like the famous academic in this area. We're talking like 50, 60 years ago. He's coming up with this model, and his big thing is um, it's clear that most investors are risk averse. And we know that because more risky investments, on average, deliver more return. So, it's the, pr the practical, empirical evidence is people are risk averse. And therefore, if they're going to take on risk, they would need to be compensated. So the key factors in selecting assets are these things. <laughs> the return that, an, av that uh, an investment can deliver, guys, the mean or the average. And as we know from yesterday, risk can be measured by variance. So they call this mean variance optimization, another technical way of talking about this. 
we want to we want to find the op optimal asset mix that's in a portfolio so eg guys how about this the sharp ratio which we're going to cover a bit later today again named after an academic called william sharp he says okay what you can do you can look at the uh, return that you've achieved minus what everybody can get from the market, which is called the risk-free rate. So you can put your money in the bank, you can put your money in T-bills, it's going to be fairly safe. And you can divide by the standard deviation. Now, standard deviation fix is just related to variance. So it's a square root, actually, of variance. It's related. And the idea is if you can deliver more return over what the government can offer, and of course you're taking less risk in doing so, we can say that a superior sharp ratio would just be a higher number. Optimal asset mix, so I want the highest sharp ratio, basically. And that's true for any investor wants the highest sharp ratio because it means the most you know, return for risk taken. But uh, in order to do this, folks, remember that phrase diversification. Diversification is about trying to maximize the risk return trade-off. And so it includes a study of correlations. Um, correlations, how two assets relate to each other, correlate. Uh, if they do not correlate exactly, i.e. move in exactly the same direction at the same time, you will have some uh, optimization of return versus risk. We'll have a look, guys, at correlations as a separate topic coming up, but it's about looking at diversification benefits. And that really all you know, is related to that idea. Now, um, stochastic modeling, folks, is where the uh, advisor, the you know, portfolio planner, is trying to assess where investments might be in a year's time. So how much might be the price of a security in a year? Now, we can use historical data, uh, i.e. past performance, to model thousands of possible investment return outcomes. Now, there are generally two approaches to uh, modeling uh, returns. Um, they mention, guys, here deterministic, number one. They mention deterministic, number one, which is forecasting using probabilities. Uh, the most typical example of this is called the binomial model. This is where you suggest there are two possible outcomes for a price in one year. Let's say there's a 20% chance of this happening, there's an 80% chance of that happening. You cover all the potential outcomes. Not that we have to do that, but it's just you use probabilities, e.g. two possible outcomes for a price in one year, and that would be the binomial model. And number two, folks, one, it is a lot more uh, powerful, but uh, complicated as well. It's called stochastic. And this one, folks, simulate returns by running many thousands of trials. Uh, you may have heard, guys, of the Monte Carlo model. Monte Carlo is something which uh, is a phrase we use for where you have a model which is predicting so thousands of outcomes. Uh, and uh, the model is allowed to have its own chaos in that outcome. It doesn't mean you just specify the share will be here, the share will be there. The model itself can determine some randomness uh, in the outcome, which is more realistic. And because of all these thousands, it's a powerful predictor. Then you take an average, really, or say a thousand different outcomes, take an average. And that, then, is where you predict the price to go. OK, so um, if you come across, guys, Monte Carlo techniques of uh, modeling performance, that would be an example of stochastic. Now, I'm assuming, folks, that uh, you know, as, an, as a modeler, as a uh, planner of a portfolio, you have an idea where you think uh, prices of assets will go. And then you're going to make allocations. Now, if I believe, folks, that generally over the long term, I'm going to expect pr share prices to go up, generally property prices to go up, my long term view is to allocate to equities and property. Uh, I'll have something in cash, obviously, for emergencies, and I'll have something in other asset classes for diversification. But your strategic asset allocation means the long term view of the planner. So, e.g., keeping no more than 5% in the long term in cash, uh, say 30% in bonds, 
and 65 percent uh, say in equity. So for example that's my long-term view but guys as market conditions change there's no reason why I can't of course alter underweight overweight various asset classes. So where indeed equity is doing particularly badly I can underweight equity and overweight bonds or indeed underweight bonds and overweight cash. So I'm looking for uh, short-term guys adjustments to take advantage this will be, of course, really active planning. You're sort of thinking about short-term market movements. Okay, so overweight guys, underweight each asset class as you need to, to take advantage, because your long-term view does not have to be stuck at all, all times. If we just turn over here, guys, we're going to show you. Now, the passive managers, um, for example, guys, ETFs, uh, tracker funds, let's say an example, they are looking to match performance of a benchmark. Obvious examples could be the FTSE 100. Now, the ways in which you match uh, will tell us a bit about your strategy and, of course, your transaction costs as well. So, if we imagine if we imagine a tracker fund, what are the methods, folks, them to match performance? of a benchmark. Again, let's say for my example, e.g. the FTSE. The FTSE 100. So the easiest way, guys, of course, is just to go and buy all the shares of the FTSE 100 in the correct weighting, which would be market capitalization. Of course, this would entail a lot of share trades, we can imagine, lots of stamp duty, lots of commissions, and therefore the transaction cost is very expensive. But Essentially, it's the most uh, obvious way in which you could replicate an index. So, full replication, guys, the first method there. Buying each constituent in the index. Of course, according to their weighting. We know from yesterday, um, if it's a price weight index, essentially you buy the same volume of every security. If it's market value weight, you buy according to the market capitalization. So, it's important that. Very expensive, though. I'm talking the, the transaction cost. And of course, uh, not just is it expensive to, rep to replicate it, but the index has not stayed the same. We, of course, remember, guys, uh, rebalancing is necessary needed. Rebalancing is where the weightings are out of sync. So especially true for equal weighted indices, where you want to keep the same uh, monetary amount invested in each asset. And so assets which lose value, you actually have to buy more of it. Assets which gain value, you sell it. So there's that issue as well. Um, now, the, um, the other aspect, other way guys are doing this would be called stratified sampling. This is uh, where you, for example, you look at each sector of the industry, so look all the, all the, sorry, each sector of the market, and you buy the most influential companies in each sector. Let's say oil and gas, technology, retail. You, know, you go and you select let's say the biggest five companies in each sector. Now that means you're still getting, of course, um, a good representation of the 100 companies, but it's less expensive. Okay, so you guys, in each sector, you select the largest companies and you just buy those. And so you, the, the point about stratified, guys, is that you're still getting a representation. But otherwise, what happens if you just say, out of 100 companies, I'll just select the you know, 20 at random. I could end up selecting 20 from the same sector, and that's not representative. So this is a way of correcting that, saying, no, no, take five at least from each, you know, from each sector. So you cover all the uh, various groups. Now the last one, folks, is called optimization, and that is just correlation study. So it could be I just buy an ETF product. The ETF product is heavily correlated to the index of the FTSE. Yeah? I don't need to buy any shares of the FTSE. 
So optimization generally goes derivative products or you know ETF products. They are correlated, aren't they, to the index, and that's good enough. Okay, buy assets correlated with the benchmark there. Uh, because the advantages, guys, of indexation, as they call it, um, which means tracking, is that uh, generally, I think the empirical evidence is that it's very difficult to outperform a index uh, in reality. Because active managers are having to hunt around for good you know, deals, good values, you know, overpriced, underpriced securities. And there's a cost, of course, of doing that. And sometimes the cost of doing that outweighs any possible benefits they achieve. So, in fact, it's probably better off not trying to do that. Passive approach is cheaper, end up performing better. Disadvantages, obvious, folks, as we said, you have to keep, of course, adjusting your index, in, in, adjusting your uh, portfolio to match the benchmark. And uh, if the index is falling, then so, of course, is your portfolio value. We talk about this term, guys, outperform the benchmark. Uh, the phrase they use is alpha. So do uh, these active funds generate alpha? They may do, but is it still alpha for you after the fees that you're having to pay? Maybe not. Talking, guys, of course, about uh, this term promotions and demotions as well for indexation. Uh, the FTSE 100, for example, is uh, reconstituted every quarter. So companies going out of the index, demoted. Companies coming into the index, promoted. So you'll have to, of course, have trading costs for that anyway. Okay, everyone, how about uh, the, uh, of course, other side of the coin on active investment management? Think about hedge funds. That's probably the most uh, likely starting point for this. But of hedge fund strategies. From yesterday, guys, we were talking about um, things like global macro. That was one of the uh, strategies we talked about. That's, of course, really where the funds are looking across uh, macroeconomics. You know, they're looking at countries, thinking about opportunities for investment return across asset classes. So countries, asset classes, it's really a top-down approach because they start by thinking about, say, property, bonds, shares, and they'll have uh, a decision to make about which asset class offers the best opportunity. And they can do that by using their own internal committee, which they, the big fund managers usually would have their own internal decision-making process there, or they could do it at least by reference to what other funds are doing, which is by consensus. So organizations such as CAPS, that's uh, the Combined Actuarial Performance Services, they provide data regarding what the uh, tracking error is. Now, tracking error, guys, is the differential between what the fund is doing and what the uh, benchmark is doing. So we want to see the median tracking error, so the average tracking error, and see how we compare to that median. Now, that's the first stage, guys, of top-down. You have to decide on your asset allocation. So by reference to an internal committee or by consensus means by looking at your peer group and seeing what's happening there. CAPS is an example of what they provide data. So you just average divergence from the benchmark is this idea of tracking error. So you want to know what kind of divergence, I mean, asset allocation-wise, you know, by how much difference is it from what the benchmark is doing for, say, shares and bonds. Uh, there is, of course, the uh, decision, guys, taken to select assets will hedge market risk where necessary. Uh, remember, market risk, guys, is beta. So what is the beta of the fund going to be? Now, the hedge fund might, might determine that the beta needs to be close to zero, which they would call market neutral. 
They may not want to be market neutral. But if they're a beta, which is positive, guys, that means they're playing market direction. Market, the fund goes in, up in value, so will their returns increase. So what about market risk? They've got to make a decision to what degree they want to hedge beta. Then comes the uh, sector selection. Of course, guys, this is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, you're looking at opportunities in then a country, um, in an asset class, and then finally make the selection of your stocks. So a global macro strategy. Let's say, guys, our example of a fund is having to think about the big picture and then, of course, tailing, tailing down to working out what they're going to invest in. Say my example, e.g. global macro. Now, what is uh, guys, fundamental and technical analysis all about? Well, basically, fundamentals are looking at the companies themselves. What are the company's prospects for growth, for profits, yeah? cash? That's the fundamental analysis. And of course, if a company has good fundamentals, then it's generally then a good investment. Uh, we'll have to look at the price in the market currently, though. Technical analysis focuses on historic data for prices. And we can sort of try to guess, if you like, or try to assume that the history will continue into the future. And so you can sort of predict uh, the highs and lows of your asset. So technical analysis, guys, versus fundamental. trying to assess what the uh, asset or what the stock can do for you. A bottom-up approach is generally, folks, where the fund is just looking at opportunities in individual stocks. So an example would be distressed security investing from uh, our uh, examples from yesterday. This is where companies, of course, have defaulted or close to defaulting on their creditors. So they're just looking for those opportunities to pick up a bargain, buying an asset cheap. So e.g. guys, distress securities investing. Focus on individual stocks. Don't need to have to be one or the other. First, you of course have funds which are considered themselves as hybrids. Not fully active, not fully passive. They want the best of both. And two examples of that are what's called core satellite management. Because this is where the fund essentially is allocating the major portion of its capital to be passively managed. So tracking basically. And then a minority, a segment, say 30%, 20% of the fund's capital, is going to be handed over to active fund managers who will look to try to beat the benchmark. Of course, the idea is you're not having as much of a cost as active full, full on, but you're having more chance for art performance versus just pure passive. So that's the uh, core satellite idea. There is also, folks, the uh, enhanced indexing. Now, this is where you tilt your portfolio to stocks that you believe are better performers. So, um, you start off, folks, by looking to match the benchmark. You match the index by buying securing the right weighting. But then you're going to adjust your weightings accordingly. Match the benchmark, but then increase the weightings what you to believe is undervalued stocks. And uh, decrease the weighting, of course, what you believe is overvalued. So we are playing around with the weightings rather than actually investing in different securities. We're not doing that. But uh, we are effectively changing the weightings from the benchmark. Now that, folks, is called a tilt. You have indexed, you are within the benchmark securities, but you have tilted your weightings to take advantage of opportunity. Of course, this is really a semi-active strategy, isn't it? Because you have to research and determine what is under and overvalued. Now, we talked about fundamental and technical. We should actually have a slide which um, explains that properly. And also, guys, we can focus on the questions that you might be getting as well, right? So let's uh, bring this full circle and just cover this term's fundamental and technical analysis one last time. 
if especially talking about active fund managers are going to employ a fundamental analyst and a technician or technical analyst, what exactly is it they're employing them to find out? Well, the first thing is, is in terms of research, report, analysis done of prices, a fundamental analyst is looking to find out what the fair value of an asset is. Right? What does that mean, fair value? It means what it should be worth. Now, clearly, they're having to have a lot of confidence in their own ability here. But to say what something should be worth clearly says, well, compared to what it is worth. If there's a difference, we can have a decision either to buy or to sell. So the, uh, the analyst, let's say equity research analyst, is looking at all the usual story, guys. We get the company's financials, right? the balance sheet, P&L, guys, profit and loss. Right? Have a look at e earnings per share. I want to look at cash flow as well. I want to look at the quality of the management, things like that. But I want to determine what is the intrinsic value also known the fair value of the security okay guys what it should be worth based on fundamentals and then we can compare it to the actual price of the security so if the actual price is below then of course folks we're going to say oh it's undervalued we're going to have a buy signal on that if it's overvalued we're going to have a sell signal the problem of course guys with this is just because you say intrinsic value is a certain number of course you could be wrong but even if you're right it doesn't mean the market price is going to adjust in that way I mean it could be undervalued and become even more undervalued or be overvalued and become even more overvalued. So this is not, unfortunately, going to be a, a fail-safe. So the, 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 the fund says, okay, you tell me what it should be worth, right? Okay. Uh, but I'm going to have my technician guy have a look at the market's price data and have them say where we think the price is going to go. It's actually more important to me, uh, rather than saying what it should be worth, I want to know where the price is going to go. So the technician doesn't look at fundamentals. He or she is going to look at past price data. And in a, in a crude way, guys, if, it's just, if I just do a, for an example, the, um, the point is that they'll look at historic prices over a period of time. And they'll try to, uh, they'll try to have a look at where there seems to be sort of up and lower bounds for the, uh, for the share, for the, for the asset. So what they dub um, resistance levels in this, in this industry. So resistance levels means the price doesn't seem to break above this level. There's also the other way, the, the sort of floor or support level for the asset. It doesn't seem to go below this. And so what they're doing here is saying, over time, this is what's happened. And therefore, we believe that if the asset is getting close to its resistance level, it's going to fall. And if it's getting close to its support level, it's going to rise. So you can use that to gauge whether you should get in the market or get out of the market. There you go. Past price indicate buy and sell signals in case you can imagine right getting close to a support level it's a buy signal getting close to a resistance level that's a sell signal <laughs> and who cares about intrinsic value right? so you can we can use this in conjunction with the fundamental analysis then. now uh, guys for the exam I want you to be aware of three assumptions okay very it's just testable really what are the main three assumptions of technicians First of all, the market discounts everything, which means think of the market like a big supercomputer. All of the fundamentals have already been assessed by thousands of people, so don't bother having to do it again. So the price is fair in that sense already. The market moves in trends, hence we've looked at the data there, and the trends will repeat. Okay, so three key assumptions. market discounts everything so the market price is fair price moves in trends you look for the basically patterns in data we can see the patterns and the trends tend to uh, repeat itself 
And that's where we can make our trading decision. So I get two and three there. Okay, but does that seem all right? Yeah, that's cute.